Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for the kickoff of our annual John Marshall Everglades Symposium. My name is Jeff Mullins. I'm the Chief Program Officer for the Everglades Foundation. Thank you for being here. This year's four-part series will be held in key locations across South Florida between now and April, and each panel will dive into how Everglades restoration benefits each region and their economies. Tonight, we have an excellent panel who will discuss how Everglades restoration not only provides ecosystem benefits to Florida Bay, but also benefits the unique and vibrant economy that relies on it. We originally planned to be together in person tonight at the Florida Keys History and Discovery Center in Isla Mirada, but current uh, circumstances have led us to go virtual instead, unfortunately. Uh, we would like to extend enormous thank yous to the center's new executive director, Bonnie Barnes, for partnering with us, and we hope to be back in person together very soon. Named in honor of the late great environmentalist John Arthur Marshall, our symposium extends his legacy by bringing together experts who can speak to the importance of restoring and protecting the important Everglades ecosystem. We would like to extend a special thank you to John's wife, and a member of our board of directors, Nancy Marshall, for joining us this evening. Nancy, thank you very much and welcome. I would also like to acknowledge Glenn Mead, who has generously sponsored our symposium this year. And I would like to invite Chip Wilson, Glenn Mead's regional director of Florida to say a few words now. Chip. Chip, um, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but take yourself off mute and please begin again. I apologize. Um, good evening and what a great night it is. Thrilled to be here participating in the John Marshall Symposium for the Everglades Foundation and wanna thank all of you for joining us this evening. My name is Chip Wilson and I am the Glenn Meads Regional Director here in Florida and the Southeast. When Glenn Mead was asked to sponsor this series of symposiums with the Everglades Foundation, we were honored to be part of an initiative that is so vital to our country and of course our state and our future. For those of you who are not familiar with Glenn Mead, Glenn Mead's an independently owned investment and wealth management firm. We serve individuals with substantial wealth and we are also widely known for our work as an outsourced chief investment office for many prestigious endowments and philanthropic foundations. Glenn Mead was started in 1956 by the children of Joseph Pugh, the founder of Sun Oil Company. The Pugh children following in their father's philanthropic footsteps formed the Pugh Charitable Trust. These charitable trusts are now valued at over five and a half billion dollars. And in fact, the Pugh Trust currently have conservation as one of their stated missions. Glenn Mead also has a long-term commitment to conservation through our Impact Investing Initiative. Simply stated, impact investing entails investing alongside one's values. And Glenn Mead has been providing impact investment opportunities for clients who choose to do so since 2001. This way was a long way before impact investing was it in fashionable or in vogue? Quick explanation. In 2001, a client came to us and asked us to construct a portfolio for them consisting of the most environmentally aware, yet still profitable companies in the US. Our head of quantitative research said, yes, we can do that. And that is how it all began. That portfolio is still in existence today with new holdings and technologies being added all the time. The thing that made this portfolio's performance so remarkable was that at, the, at Glenn Mead, we were able to track performance and show that when you positively tilt a portfolio towards your impact goals, you can provide not only competitive investment returns, but also match your goals. In the past, negative exclusion rather than positive inclusion, was considered impact investing. In fact, it is this positive tilting that has allowed our clients to achieve so many of their impact investing goals. Again, I would like to thank 
you so much for being here tonight. And the panel discussion is surely to be fascinating as well as educational. I hope to see you all in person at the February 24th event in Stewart at the New Ocean Eco Center for the next plan series discussion in this series. And with that, I'll turn it back to Jeff and we'll get on with the program. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Chip. I really appreciate that. Appreciate yours, Glenn Mead's support and partnership. It means means a lot. Thank you. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator of tonight's panel, Emma Hadesey. Uh, Emma is the director, executive director of Florida Bay Forever in Isla Mirada. Previously, she was a park ranger at Everglades National Park. And during her time there, she gained very special expertise and a, and a keen appreciation for Florida Bay and the Everglades. Uh, so we're thrilled to have her moderate tonight's panel. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to her, but again, welcome everyone. Thank you for your time this evening. Uh, and enjoy the show. Emma. Thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. Again, my name is Emma Haydesey, Executive Director of Florida Bay Forever and your moderator for this evening's panel, Florida Bay Everglades Restoration and the Economy. Before I introduce our esteemed panelists, I do want to introduce you to Florida Bay Forever. We are a Florida Keys-based nonprofit that is dedicated to protecting and preserving Florida Bay through education and advocacy. The organization was founded in 2016 by a group of Isla Mirada residents, fishing guides, local elected officials, and business owners, all in response to one of the most devastating seagrass die-offs that we've seen on Florida Bay and seen over many decades due to a lack of uh, freshwater flow. Since then, we have worked to educate Monroe County residents about the importance of Everglades restoration to the health of our bay, our economy, and community, while simultaneously working to advance restoration projects that directly benefit the bay and the Florida Keys. That's why I'm so honored to host this important conversation with such a wonderful and esteemed group of panelists. And while I think they need no introduction, I would like to welcome and introduce each of them to you in our audience before we get started with the panel tonight. First up is Dr. Steve David. My apologies for the drop off, everybody. Um, to come back, uh, I would like to continue our introduction with Steve Davis. Um, and Steve, I wanna thank you so much for being here with us tonight. My pleasure, it's good to be here. <laughs> All right, next up on our uh, panelists this evening, I'd like to introduce fellow Isla Mirada resident and South Florida Water Management District Governing Board member, Cheryl Meads. Cheryl is a dedicated water quality advocate and Florida Keys resident who believes protecting this precious resource is key to positively impacting the lives of all who call South Florida home. She has previously served on the <laughs> Island Rodeo Council and continues to champion efforts to restore and save the sea grasses that are essential to Florida Bay as a governing board member of the South Florida Water Management District. 
Cheryl is a scientist by trade who holds a degree in chemistry with education, training, and experience in biology, microbiology, and water analysis. When she is not working, very hard to safeguard and restore South Florida's water resources and ecosystems. Cheryl and her, her husband, Mike, are part-time Christian missionaries who joyfully serve in the Philippines. Cheryl, thank you so much for lending your voice this evening and being with us. Emma, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. And finally, no stranger to Florida Bay is Dr. Jennifer Rehage. Jennifer is a coastal fish ecologist and professor at the mm -hmm. Institute of the Environment at Florida International University in Miami, Florida. Research and her team examines how water management decisions interact with climate to affect fish and the quality of recreational fisheries. Over the last 15 years, Dr. Rehage has been studying snook, juvenile tarpon, and bonefish among other fisheries in the Everglades and the Florida Keys, all the while collaborating with anglers and guides to better understand recreational fisheries and their dependency on water management and healthy habitats. Jennifer, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Emma. It's a huge pleasure. Thank you. All right, well, let's dive right in this evening. And I wanna start with Steve. Could you briefly explain to us the connection between Florida Bay and the greater Everglades watershed? Well, it, it, it's important to first recognize that Florida Bay is an estuary and estuaries in general are where fresh water, uh, generally from rivers, meet the sea mixing with ocean water. And so it uh, is a mixing of that fresh and salt water that gives rise to the, the habitats that we associate with this ecosystem. And then, of course, the fisheries, the marine mammals, the turtles that all depend uh, on that estuarine habitat. In this case, it's the river of grass that provides that fresh water that's essential to sustaining those salinities in Florida Bay. Um, it's a little more complicated than that when you think that Everglades National Park uh, requires water from the north, uh, from the water conservation areas. Historically, that water came from also Lake Okeechobee and all the way up the Kissimmee Basin to where Orlando is today. Um, but once we get that water down to Tamiami Trail, and we'll talk a, a little bit about the restoration projects later, uh, that water can take two paths. It can go through Shark River Slough, uh, which is the main flow path that, that kind of flows from northeast to southwest, uh, emptying in Shark River and in Whitewater Bay. That water does, in fact, influence salinities in Florida Bay because it freshens, it's such a large volume of water that it freshens the nearshore waters that get pulled into Florida Bay, uh, roughly right where I am right now in Flamingo, uh, in Everglades National Park. And that water continues its way into Florida Bay through that tidal pool and influences uh, the salinities from the west. We also know that Taylor Slough is an important flow path, uh, direct flow path for getting fresh water into Florida Bay, but in the eastern half of the bay. And that's a much smaller watershed, but it's really the, the collective uh, impact of both of those sources from the east and from the west that keeps Florida Bay healthy. But it's also important to recognize that uh, those flows have been reduced greatly over time and really is one of the uh, justifications for Everglades restoration. We talk a lot about getting more water south. Ultimately, it's getting water south through the park and down into Florida Bay. And that's where we really achieve uh, success with restoration. Thanks for that, Steve. I want to shift over to Jennifer. Isla Morada is known as the sport fishing capital of the world, which is one of the central economic drivers for the Florida Keys. Through your research on the fisheries in Florida Bay, what are the major impacts that you've seen and how might Everglades restoration help? Thank you for that, Emma. Um, as we all know, our fisheries are an incredible part of the culture of the Florida Keys and South Florida, and also the economy. As you said, 20% of tourism dollars are driven from fisheries, and that's because over 50%, 60% of the tourists that come to the Keys 
5.5 million every year go fishing. So we have an enormous impact of our fisheries locally. Um, and our fisheries are stressed. They're stressed by habitat loss and deterioration associated with the seagrass die-offs that you mentioned earlier. Um, as we get hypersalinity, we're also stressing out our fish because those are stressful conditions. Salinity is too high. And then fisheries are either directly dependent on freshwater or indirectly dependent on freshwater. So for instance, snook are, everything about their lives of snook is dependent on freshwater, what they eat, where they are, how healthy they are, how fat they are. It all depends on the amount of fresh water. Um, for other fisheries like sea trout is an indirect effect where we have freshwater flows that affect the level of salinity as Steve was describing. If it gets too salty, that's super stressful for sea trout and it can cause mortality. And then has a, that has a negative effect on our fisheries. And then we have, you know, turbid conditions as we lose seagrass and we get turbid conditions that make it hard for fishing and also stressful for fish. So. Restoration can do away with all of that, right? Because we can get additional freshwater flows that can promote healthy fisheries and maintain those salinities and prevent the, the sort of devastating effects of the seagrass die off event as, as we saw in 2015. Thanks for your insight on that, Jennifer. Uh, Cheryl, you are no stranger to using your voice for Florida Bay here in our community in the Keys, but also uh, in your role on the governing board. How do you continue that momentum needed to complete Everglades restoration projects in, in your capacity and role with the South Florida Water Management District? Oh, thanks. So I, I have a silly picture that I've asked to be thrown up as I answer this question. I don't know if we can do it or not. Oh, I love this. Okay. Carry yourself with the confidence of a girl holding a massive owl. So when I think about this work with the district in restoration, I think mostly about stakeholders. And all of the stakeholders remind me of this incredible, beautiful owl. So beautiful and, and, and very potentially troublesome. And, and I say that, you can take the picture down now, but I see myself like that little girl, believe it or not, I looked a lot like that when I was about four. But you know, you were all so very passionate. You were so engaged and and I have learned, I mean, that we have this great situation where we all came in raw and we all came in new. And Tim, uh, Steve met with me and, 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 and you all educated me, um, not just the foundation, but other stakeholders. And we have come this very long way. And I like to talk about it in terms of human relationships and groups, you know, the forming, the storming and the norming that I've talked about recently in a meeting. When we first got together, man, I mean, there was some real storming in the beginning. But we've come to this, in my opinion, this really sweet place where so much work is being done in every direction in the system at a, at a rate that is so unbelievable. How can we not all take pride in what's happening here? And it really is being stakeholder driven. It, uh, it really, really is. I mean, there is a project plan, there's no doubt, but we are listening and I mean, we may still fight once in a while, but I, I feel something has changed and we have momentum like we've never had before. And um, it's, it's really an amazing, beautiful thing to be part of. And we're so grateful for all that you do on the district for us, Cheryl. Steve, I want to pivot back to you and just to um, put a fine point on what some of those major restoration projects are. We're seeing all of these milestones. I feel like every month is a new ribbon cutting or groundbreaking. What are the restoration projects that are in the process of being built that will directly benefit the Florida Keys community? Well, let me just first say amen to that momentum, Cheryl. And, you know, we, we see it on our side as well, that there's there's truly 
uh, engagement on both sides and, and really a, an effort across the board to make this happen. And um, Emma, to your, your question, we've, we've seen so much progress just over the last five years in, in Everglades restoration. And, and it's important to recognize that some of that began before the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan was passed in 2000. There were projects that were planned for Everglades National Park to redirect the flow of water uh, into Shark River Slough that led to the bridging that we now see on Tamiami Trail, uh, bridging that provides the plumbing to get water to where it needs to go, ultimately ending its journey in Florida Bay and, and on along our southwest coast. So th that kind of speaks to what these projects are designed to do in you know first it's about getting more water south i mentioned that earlier uh and we know that lake okeechobee is the source of that water the historic source of that water building a reservoir south of lake okeechobee is going to be a game changer uh for delivering massive volumes of water uh to the south water that is not going to be polluted water that we will have to clean through stormwater treatment areas to meet the standard that's protective of the ecosystem. So sending more clean water south uh, through projects like the Everglades Reservoir, making sure that that water's clean through the construction of those stormwater treatment areas. Uh, that That's really the, the pivotal phase, but we also need the plumbing projects like Tamimi Trail completion of raising the trail to to allow for those restoration quantities of flow back into the park and then once we get that water in the park we need to ensure that it stays there that it's not flooding adjacent communities to the east so those seepage control measures stopping the leaks from everglades national park so that we can ensure that water is delivering uh, uh, benefits to the park ultimately down to florida bay and the florida keys so collectively uh, these projects have been in the works since the late 1980s and we're, we're seeing enormous progress i mentioned the bridges are, are nearly complete the the seepage measures along the eastern boundary and the water management district got to give them the credit for for moving expeditiously on the eight and a half square mile area to get the seepage barrier there which really unlocks our potential to raise water levels further upstream flow more water under the bridges and and again ultimately get it down to Everglades National Park and, and Florida Bay. So we're seeing lots of progress. There's there's much work that's yet to be done. We haven't broken ground on the reservoir, but the state has gotten out ahead on the stormwater treatment area for that reservoir project. But th those are, are critical. Uh, and we relayed that message today to General Kelly and to Colonel Booth, the new uh, Jacksonville uh, uh, Colonel and um, they understand the importance of that project in, in protecting places like Florida Bay. Really amazing to see um, such expeditious progress for all of these projects. Jennifer, I would love to, to ask you about fisheries and the angling community. We are a community of anglers here in the Florida Keys who live and die by the water. In conjunction with your research on fisheries, how do you connect with anglers in the community to ensure, number one, that they know what's going on in the ecosystem, but ultimately how they can spread that knowledge to tourists and anglers who are on their boat when they come to visit the island chain? Um, our angling and fishing community and our guide community is just amazing, as you know, Emma. They're just incredible partners in conservation. And I, we, we are where we are today. Uh, with Everglades restoration because a lot, a big part of that because of our anglers and our fit and our guides. And this is something to be grateful that engagement that Cheryl was mentioning and that those stakeholders are partially, a huge part of our, our, is our fishing community. So we're super grateful for that. And you know, often as scientists, because we have such data limited fisheries and we know very little about the, you know, we, we have such little monitoring, we know so little about our fisheries that we are actually using the, doing the opposite. We are relying on angler knowledge and on the expertise of anglers and fishing guides to find out what's going on. <laughs> and this is an amazing source of information. It's an, 
non-traditional source of information, but an incredibly valuable source of information. And we're just beginning to learn that and incorporate this expert knowledge because truly it is expert knowledge from our guides that spend 200 days on the water, 20 or 30 years in Florida Bay. Those guys know a lot of information. And so we rely on that expert knowledge and engage with them um, on that exchange of information. And we often are the ones learning from them and also learning at conditions that are sort of kind of uh, on the fly, things are developing, you know, our guides on the water are, the, are our eyes and ears to what's going on with the bay. And this is a wonderful resource. So an open communication has been, is in great collaboration and what we call knowledge co-production, where we engage in understanding what's going on with the fisheries together, putting together the angler knowledge through surveys, through interviews, putting that together and bringing that forth so the public can know about what we know about our fisheries from our guides. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Uh, before I move on to the next question, I do want to put a call out to our audience to please go ahead and drop any questions you have for our wonderful panelists in the chat. We will have some time for Q&A as we wrap up the panel today. So please go ahead and start thinking about those questions and typing them into the Q&A so that we can get to that in just a bit. But I do want to now turn it over to Cheryl. And I will go ahead and say it, the word legacy has been thrown around with this governing board. Um, and so I wanna hear from you, how do you see the work that you're doing today benefiting Florida Bay and Everglades restoration in the future and really future generations of South Floridians? You know, when I think about this governing board, I always come back to you, you know, the stakeholders and, and, and the governor and the governor's office, because this um, governing board is, they're just a really great group of people. I don't know them any better or any, you probably know them all better than, than I do, but they're so much fun to work with and they all bring so many different things to the table. But for me, I'm not a Floridian. So I, uh, I moved here, you know, 11 years ago and I came from a place where water, clean, fresh, cold water was abundant in the Appalachian Mountains. And to come down here and to realize that we really are at a crisis point. We were as close to as too late as you can get in this process. And, and it has come together at this time because of the work of, I, I believe the environmental community really just came together and the governor's office, you know, you've got a governor that heard you and has put together this plan and the staff, our staff is unbelievable. It's hard to keep up with them. I mean, they're really, really, really amazing. So you know, now is the time. I don't think DeSantis is going anywhere. He is going to be, you know, not to get into the politics of it, but but he is committed and Tallahassee is committed and the federal government is committed. We are, it is raining down because of hard work throughout the past years. And I was I was at one of the groundbreakings and I actually looked over at Shannon Estenis and said, look at what you've done. You know, it has taken how many, Steve, how many years have you been doing this? So this governing board, we're just lucky to, to be here and to sit up there as it, as it all finally comes together with a, with a fierceness and we see the water coming now and we will only get more. So we, you know, we have a reason. And I'll tell you that, that I really love the meeting in Okeechobee. I, I, gotta, I gotta move to Okeechobee. I really love the meeting up there. And if you watched it, the last farmer just I love that guy. I, I, I'm going to have to look up his name. He said, this is the best governing board meeting we have ever had. 
We've been doing this all of these years, but this is the best meeting we've had. We're all here, we're all working together, DEP and you know FDAX, and we're all there in it, in it. And we feel that sense, um, that great sense of, of pride. And for me with stakeholders, I don't, I see everybody's passion because you all have a history together. You know, you, the, the ranchers have a history with the district and it, and it hasn't always been pleasant, but we're in a new place and a new age in a new way. And, and the water is coming and it is only going to get better and brighter. I don't see anything slowing down. Do you? That's great. Thanks. No, Cheryl, that's fantastic. And again, we are just so grateful for the work that you do and the staff at the district and your fellow governing board members for really making this top priority. I want to shift over now into a bit of a hot topic section. Um, there has been a lot of focus and discussion this year on the northern estuaries and on Lake Okeechobee, which seems really far and away from us here in the Florida Keys and on Florida Bay for the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual or LOSM process. And uh, Steve, can you tell us how Florida Bay will benefit from the recently selected and updated schedule and why this is so important for the residents of Monroe County? Sure. and. It you know, it, it, it's important to think about how the historic system worked. It, it was connected from top to bottom and, and Lake Okeechobee was the nexus of connection for the Everglades and Florida Bay to the south. Um, so this massive 700 square mile lake that's 100 miles to the north uh, matters when it comes to Florida Bay and how we manage water in Lake Okeechobee matters to Florida Bay. And, and what we have, have come to, at least thus far, in this uh, Lake Okeechobee system operating manual is a plan that aims to strike a balance with how water is managed uh, uh, north, south, east, and west. Uh, whereas before, uh, in the current operational rule book for Lake Okeechobee, it was emphasizing the fragility of the Herbert Hoover Dyke that surrounds the lake. And we know that we get roughly the same amount of rainfall today as we did when the Everglades was in its natural pre-drainage state. Uh, you know, down here, it's roughly five feet of rainfall. That water would historically make its way to the south. Um, now, because the Everglades agricultural area has, has been uh, sort of carved out of this ecosystem and provided flood protection for agriculture, that water can't flow south naturally the way it once did. Uh, and many folks in the audience know that that water that would come south is now sent east and west. And with concerns over dike failure, those releases are often made in an anticipatory fashion. Uh, without any uh, 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 ability to wonder what weather conditions might be a week or two weeks from now, uh, simply because the, the, the prime objective is flood control and concerns over dike failure uh, result in those frequent and massive discharges of polluted lake water. Um, so operations are incredibly important. We know infrastructure is important, but how that uh, infrastructure is operated is important. And we, we've seen that in this lowsome process. In this case, the new infrastructure is a repaired Herbert Hoover Dyke. And what that repaired Herbert Hoover Dyke allows water managers is a little more flexibility in how they manage the water. And what we've seen with this emphasis on balance is a, a willingness to hold water in the lake a little bit longer uh, reducing those east-west discharges in the wet season, and during the dry season, allowing more of that water to go south uh, to the Everglades and ultimately to Florida Bay. And, and it's really on the order that the benefits that we're seeing with this lowsome process, 30-plus uh, percent reduction in those harmful discharges to each coast, 
uh, and upwards of 27 billion gallons of new clean water going south just in the dry season. Uh, and that's really when the ecosystem needs that water. So this, this plan is, is really, and, and the emphasis on balance is welcome. And, and we see it as a big victory uh, region wide in terms of how water is going to be allocated. And it really only, uh, what, what, what it does more than anything is it aligns uh, the operations of this lake with the goals and objectives of Everglades restoration, which is really how the system functioned historically. So I, I, I think beginning December of 2022 or early 2023, we stand to see the benefits of this loathsome plan. So within the next year, uh, we're going to see benefits from this accruing. And then when we add the reservoir on top of that, the additional infrastructure to send more clean water south, uh, we're going to see big benefits throughout the Everglades all the way down to Florida Bay. Well, we're really excited about the CORE's updated plan and all of the benefits that we're going to see down here on the Bay and in the Keys. I want to follow up with Cheryl. You know, the Army Corps is, of course, charged with overseeing the lake and with and LOSAM, but the, the district had such a, a critical role in, in developing and creating this new schedule. Can you speak to that? Sure. Yeah, that this has been such an interesting process because it really very passionate and all of the stakeholders, all of the, I mean, I believe every governing board member met with everyone who asked us to meet with them. And there were many, many, many. And everybody had, you know, their 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 side, you know, their view of of what they what they needed. And it was um, hard, you know, it was a hard process. And if you watched us as we went through it, it was, it was um, pretty difficult. But, you know, I, I think with some more modifications that we're in a, a great place considering where we've been. Um, everyone is is in a great place so so people like to um talk about it in different terms but to be clear no one is losing anything we are we are sharing differently in the adversity and that is a welcome belief for those of us in Monroe County, for those in St. Lucie, for those in the Caloosahatchee. This is um, welcome news. So this is all, all good stuff. And um, it all happened so fast. I didn't know that you guys could model that fast. I mean, it was, it's, it's really something. So yeah, it's been great. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, I have one more formal question before we kick off the Q&A section. So again, all of our audience, please go ahead and, and enter in all of your burning questions for our panelists before we get into that section. But I do wanna finish off with Jennifer. Your research has been so instrumental in helping us to grow our understanding of the benefits of restoration and increased freshwater flow for Florida Bay fisheries. Can you speak to how events like Hurricane Irma might give us a glimpse into the future of Florida Bay post-restoration and what that future may look like from an angler's perspective? Thank you for that. Yeah, it's, it's super interesting to see what we're learning about our fisheries and about freshwater responses from our hurricanes. And the, this is because the hurricanes are bringing these freshwater flows, particular Irma, and we saw the same thing with Etta more recently in those late fall 2020 storms. These large flows of freshwater at the right time, right, with the, during those, those high water volume um, periods that are mimicking restoration effects. We're getting these high volumes of discharge and we're making, uh, we're doing a great job of bringing that water into the bay, particularly with Etta, we saw really high flows come into the bay in low salinities. So those, those events, despite their destructive activity, hurricanes are fertilizing up the Everglades, promoting uh, mangrove forests, and they're promoting our fisheries. And this is because their triggers the spawning activity. 
So when we have these storms come through, we know that fishes are known to spawn during the, the, storm, the storm event itself. As the storm is going by, we had documentation that our snook and the shark river were going downstream to spawn as the storm is going by. And other, other, other researchers have documented this for other species, and we saw it for snook in, in the Everglades. So we have this massive spawning activity, this pulse of reproduction that happens as a function of that freshwater flow and the, the pressure itself, the, the, the fish are also responding to the pressure event plus the, the high flow event that's acts the trigger for them to go downstream and spawn. And we saw the same thing with, with redfish also uh, as a function of, of Irma. And now we have all of these hurricane babies that Stephen, we were just talking about this before, Steve just saw them, uh, in Florida Bay. This really, our, our fisheries are in great shape because of these freshwater events that are pulses of, of, um, of spawning activity. And you know, many of us were wondering like, ooh, do we have enough food? Do we have enough habitat for all these babies that are bouncing around in 2017? And thankfully we did. And these babies are now entering our fisheries and now they're entering ha harvest sub harvest slices. Uh, and our fisheries are in great shape from those pulses of fresh water. Edda, we also saw with Edda that we, we got the lowest salinity levels in Florida Bay that we've seen in 15 years because of ETA. So these hurricanes are great promoters in maintaining the integrity of the Everglades until we get restoration coming along. But in the meantime, they're giving us these pulses of, of freshwater events. And we saw it in the fisheries. We also saw it in the, in the uh, wading birds. We have it amazing waiting bird years of, of nesting and production due to the hurricane. So our wildlife and our fauna is responding to freshwater flow events, just like we thought they would and we hope they would, but we never had the ability to test it. And the hurricanes are providing with that ability to test that. And it's, it, we're so grateful for those, those, those events and the ability to learn their other responses of our fisheries and our waiting birds. Bodes well for what the future of restoration will look like for our bay and for our communities here in the Keys. So I am just going to, uh, before we get into the q and I just want to thank all of our panelists again for your insight and really your combined decades of service and commitment to restoration on the Bay. And I am going to open up our Q&A box and see what questions we've got there. All right, so I'm going to start with a question for Steve. What changes have you seen in Florida Bay and the Shark River area due to the increased water flow? Well, I, I think what uh, Dr. Rehage just described is, is perhaps the most uh, notable from Florida Bay perspective, Florida Keys is the, the improvements to fisheries and, and just setting the, the, the the right quantity and timing of that water to influence those nearshore salinities to trigger uh, the, those behaviors that that lead to reproduction events that that send the fisheries through the roof. Um, th that's really what our models would have predicted. Um, and she also mentioned wading birds. Um, the the numbers of wading birds has been remarkable in those years, especially following. Hurricane Irma, but from the standpoint of the mangroves, getting some of those wading birds and, and returning some of the super colonies into those coastal mangrove forests is something that we weren't sure would happen. Uh, that was something that was documented uh, nearly a century ago and, and a, a, a sort of a, a trait that the natural Everglades ecosystem supported was having those coastal colonies of birds and seeing those birds return into those coastal mangrove forests, uh, that, that, was, that was also an important indicator that we're on the right path, that we know what we're doing, that we know the benefits that we'll be able to glean from Everglades restoration. We still have some things to learn um, and, and we're, we're digging deeper in terms of understanding how mangrove forests will respond to increased freshwater flow um, that was actually one of the objectives of my dissertation back in the 1990s, uh, and we're continuing to study that, uh, not just from how the, the mangroves will respond to the, the increased freshwater flow, but how that might also improve the carbon sequestration capacity 
of those forests that we know are so incredibly important in uh, building up peat soils, sequestering that carbon in both the soil and in the wood. Uh, and that also provides the, the function of protecting our shorelines against hurricanes like Hurricane Irma. So there's a lot of feedback effects that those mangroves provide, but it all starts with getting more fresh water moving through the ecosystem. Absolutely, thanks for that, Steve. And related, uh, as you're talking about carbon sequestration for Jennifer, we have a question. What is the next generation of environmental advocates at FIU specifically doing to affect change with sea level rise and saltwater intrusion? We're doing a lot of work um, co uh, in collaboration with the municipalities in the urban footprint, trying to understand the effects of sea level rise. Uh, at the scale, and a lot of that involves citizen science, which is really great. So we're involving citizens and students, we're involving uh, just people in the different communities to keep track of sea level and take data, which is really part and it really part of the part of the you know involvement of the stakeholders and engagement into science and into these important issues that are so concerning for our society. So that's been really rewarding to see that in the urban footprint. It's just so hard sometimes in big cities like Miami to get that engagement that you guys have so luckily in the keys and small communities right it's a challenge for us in a big city with two points you know 2.6 million people just in our count in one county alone so to get that sense of community and to have those um those programs has been really rewarding trying to get those you know and as as we see that miami is becoming ground zero for sea level rise right and we have the eye um, a lot of attention being brought into sea level because of what's happening in the local municipalities. So it's been trying to take advantage of that, of that, um, that interest with citizen science in particular. It's been really successful. Thank you, Jennifer, for that. All right, I would like to shift over. Cheryl, we have a question about the governing board, so I'm going to pivot that to you. And I'd love to ask what the governing board is doing in order to address decreasing nutrient loading. So I think that, you know, we are not leaving anything unturned when we are, you know, addressing the, the nutrient problems that we have. And I think that staff is doing a really good job at that holistic approach. Um, from, you know, from the very beginning in the early days, I remember how when we looked at the maps of, of um, nutrient levels and hot spots and as new people, we started asking ourselves, well, why here and why here and why here? And, you know, a lot of concern about the, the, the uh, what's going on up north. And, um, you know, clearly we can't continue to clean up water at the level of the nutrient level that we currently have coming into the lake. And so we're looking at everything, you know, we're looking at new technologies, we're looking at, at everything, we're willing to do everything. You know, I actually thought, and I know that it's kind of crazy, but I actually thought, you know, somebody should send Elon Musk a letter. You know, the Everglades Foundation should send him a letter. If you look at, at, at what he does, you know, and how his mind works, somebody should say, hey, look at some of the problems that we have here and see if he, you know, but there, it is new technologies that are coming and everybody's doing their part. I mean, all of the stakeholders, we're all doing our part. And there's a lot to be concerned about for South Florida. Um, I see things about questions about development and overdevelopment. And, you know, there's always going to be a lot of stress and pressure on paradise. And, and in our particular case, we have a lot of uh, stakeholders here as well who have a, a seat at the table. They've been here for many generations and ag is one of those stakeholders. They have a seat here and, um, and we just all have to pull the rope together. Thanks for that, Cheryl. I'm gonna hop back into the Q&A. We have a 
question. Uh, just talking about anglers and fishing guides. We have a lot of people who come to the Florida Keys to enjoy the water. We've got recreational boaters, campers, kayakers, snorkelers, divers. Is there um, a, a reason that we focus on, on anglers and, and maybe what can we do to engage with the broader community of folks who come to enjoy our waters here in the Florida Keys? And that's open to any of our panelists. Well, uh, Emma, I'll just, I'll start. The, the, the reason why we spend a lot of time talking about, um, you know, fisheries and uh, and wading birds, really. I, I think we, we've touched on that a few times already this evening, is that th those are key indicators of the health of the ecosystem. And if we can restore uh, wading bird populations to some, you know, sizable fraction of what they were historically, then we've achieved success in the freshwater side of the Everglades. And we know to some extent, the health of Florida Bay is tied to the freshwater ecosystem. And so it's important that we track the fisheries and, and particularly the, the recreational fisheries, which are at the top of the food chain uh, in places like Florida Bay, because if we can restore them uh, back to some semblance of what they were, we've done our job. Uh, so it, it's, it's tracking those key indicators that reflect the health of as much of the ecosystem as possible. Uh, and, and we do a pretty good job of that as a scientific community. And, and certainly Dr. Rehage's work is critical to that. Um, but it, it's, it's really identifying, understanding what the indicators are, what, what they're sensitive to, and then being able to track their performance over time as we implement restoration, as we improve operations, as we basically get the water right. And, and we're seeing through events like Hurricane Irma that we're on the right path. If, if we can restore water quantities to some semblance of that, then we, we know what the outcomes are. So it's it, it's really a direct result of the those being just robust indicators of the health of Florida Bay and the greater Everglades ecosystem. And if I may, Emma, I was just going to add that, you know, anglers are just an umbrella. They're just the representative group of recreation in general. So they just kind of include all of recreation because if you talk to anglers, they're doing wildlife, they're, they're doing um, wildlife viewing, they're engaging in sort of not just fishing. And we have 264,000 anglers that fish Florida Bay every year. So this is a really large group that encompasses all of recreation. So we talk about anglers, but we're often talking about also people that are kayaking and they're sightseeing and bird watching, and they're all under this umbrella of boaters and anglers that are just uh, enjoying the bay. And we, we think about anglers, but it's more encompassing. And I think they're just representative of the entire recreation group. Thank you both for that. I am going to Switch back over and take a look in the Q&A. Um, Dr. Davis, we have a question for you. Uh, are the designs for the STAs for the new reservoir, which we are so excited um, getting ready to be built, adequate to allow the maximum flow into Everglades National Park and meet water standards? Well, if, if you go by what tools we have available, then the answer to that is yes, but we know our tools aren't perfect. And so we need to, we know we need to make sure that the water's clean. Uh, we know that we can't allow for an erosion of benefits that were planned in terms of getting the, the necessary volumes of water uh, south to the park in, in Florida Bay. Um, but we also have contingencies and, and those contingencies have, have been identified as, as potential options to consider if we don't hit those water quality marks. We, we have to hit the, the mark in terms of water quality to protect those habitats, um, but we also have other options uh, in terms of expanding treatment capacity as we build more storage. So uh, it, it's, it, it remains to be seen. We can't rely 100% uh, on the modeling tools we have available because they're not perfect representations of nature. They're our best representations of nature. 
And we are looking everywhere to store in clean water, right? You got a piece of property and you want to, you know, you want to store in clean water. We're all, all about it. So, so not there, you know, I mean, it's really a good point. How much storage is enough? Can we ever have too much? I don't think we can ever have too much, but, um, but you know, the, these storage uh, treatment areas, gosh, they're beautiful, right? I mean, it, it, it is a, a, a multifaceted benefited thing. It is just a, a beautiful ecosystem of its own and, and all of these water holding ponds and things that we're up to. Um, really, there is just a real focus on getting it right and getting as much as quickly as possible and going in all directions. And I'll have to say again, I don't know how the staff gets it all done, but they are really, really amazing. They're incredible. Thank you both. And I think that that's a really nice note to start to wrap up on. But before we do, I would like to open it up to our panelists. If you have any final comments as we close up our panel on, on our subject this evening, Florida Bay, uh, Everglades restoration and the economy. Dr. Davis, I'll point to you first. Well, I, I'll just, you know, I was out with core leadership on the Bay uh, just a few hours ago. And one of the messages that really seemed to resonate with them was that if we can fix Florida Bay, then we've solved all the problems upstream. Uh, what that means is that with restoration, if we're getting the necessary flows down to this end of the system, that means that we're not dumping that water to the east and the west. We're putting that water back where it belongs. Uh, we know that it needs to be clean. Uh, in order to do that, we're providing for the habitats in the freshwater ecosystem. We're meeting uh, the water supply demands along the Lower East Coast. Uh, so if, if we can solve the problems down here, then we've we've done our job. Dr. Rehage, Cheryl, any final thoughts before we sign off for the evening? I, I would like to tell you that I, I don't normally Google people because people Google me and it makes me uncomfortable when they say, oh yeah, I Googled you. So I don't do that to other people. And, and what a shame because I just Googled George Barley two weeks ago. Can you believe that? Remember, I'm from North Carolina. So, and I, and I had never really, really done my research on the Everglades Foundation. And I may, I may get weepy because, you know, I have what's called my grand, my granny used to say I had a soft heart. But, you know, to look at where you guys have come from and what you accomplish and, and, it just really, really is remarkable uh, to me. I am uh, grateful to the Everglades Foundation. I know all of Florida is. Thank you. Emma, I was just gonna say, you know, um, the Bay has suffered so long from chronic deficit of fresh water, you know, gets a quarter of the amount of water that it should get, or, or we got um, pre-drainage. Um, and historically, and uh, but it, at the same time, you know, and it continues to be star for water. But the future, the future has never looked brighter for Florida Bay than it is today, with these hurricanes showing us that the bay, if we give it water, it responds in this wonderful way. Um, to see the seagrass come back from the 2015 seagrass die-off, we're in a really, really good place, and our fisheries are responding well. Um, so, and we have this amazing amount and sort of diversity of stakeholder engagement that we never had before. So I am really hopeful of the future and thanks for everything you guys do for this. Thank you for ending on such a great note. And that concludes our panel for the evening. A few words of thanks before we sign off. Of course, thank you to our wonderful panelists, Dr. Davis, Dr. Rehage, Governing Board Member Meads. Thank you so much for participating and contributing to this wonderful conversation. 
I want to say thank you to our audience for tuning in, showing up, and engaging to learn more about the importance of Everglades restoration for Florida Bay. And of course, thank you to the Everglades Foundation for hosting such an important conversation. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and a happy new year. Thank you.